Hi, I'm Mike Brewer. And after an hour, hi, I'm Mike Brewer, pastor of Blue Ash Presbyterian Church. And after an hour of fiddling with this, we seem to have things going again. My apologies to those who tuned in at uh, 1030 and found a notice about technical difficulties. Um, we hope that uh, you'll check back in later. So I may be speaking to an empty room right now, but ideally folks will be checking back on Facebook later and checking into YouTube later in the day and will be joining us belatedly. At any rate, I'm glad to be with you sooner or later and uh, glad to be celebrating this Lord's Day, this second Sunday in May with people that I love and care about, whose values I share, and whose faith is so important to my faith. A quick reminder that we are still collecting sandwiches on Thursday evenings to help the poor and homeless. Uh, you can bring those sandwiches to and uh, drop off at church between 6.30 and 8 on Thursday evenings, and Bill and Karen B. will see that they get delivered to a ministry called Our Daily Bread the following day. If you need particulars, if you haven't done this before, you can give Bill a call or give me a call and we'll go over the uh, details. They're not very complicated, but there are a couple of things you ought to know. So thanks for participating in that. Uh, we've, we've made a fine showing in our congregation and I'm very proud of the way we are reaching out to folks uh, things are difficult for us, but things are really challenging for, for some people, and it's good to give the help that we're able to give. Our call to worship today is from the letter to the Hebrews. Listen, uh, and, and let's gather our hearts together. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's what worship is about. It is about gathering before uh, the throne of mercy in the presence of God, in the name of Jesus, who lived as we live and yet remained faithful to God in all things. Our opening prayer this morning, I'm borrowing words from a song by Bruce Coburn, a songwriter that I have enjoyed for many years. Bruce Coburn is a Christian, although he doesn't write the kind of Christian music you are likely to hear on the Christian radio waves. Please bow your head with me and join me in prayer. Lord of the star fields, ancient of days, universe maker, here's a song in your praise. Wings of the storm cloud, beginning and end, you make my heart leap like a banner in the wind. Lord of the star fields, sower of life, heaven and earth are full of your light. Voice of the Nova, smile of the dew, all of our yearning only comes home to you. O love that fires the sun, keep me burning. O love that fires the sun, keep me burning. In the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Let God's people say, Amen. Uh, our opening song today, I think, will be familiar to you. Uh, Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love. Send us power. Send us grace. A fine way to approach the beginning of our worship service. Please sing with me. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your spirit praying. 
Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Clearly, I feel free to change the words around, so you can't do if you want to. Let's try it again. Lord, listen to your children pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Once more, I'll start off and then you carry it. Lord, listen to your children. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Amen. Amen. I haven't done a children's sermon in a couple of weeks, so I thought I'd do one today. Uh, I brought something that has been in use in our house lately. We've been uh, doing a lot of home projects, as a lot of you have been. And, uh, and you probably recognize this. This is a paint stirrer. Because when you open a fresh uh, can of paint or a can that's been sitting for a while, you need to mix the uh, you need to mix the base and the and the coloring so it's all blended well so that you don't get uh, thin streaks and uneven streaks. So it takes a little stirring sometimes to get the paint ready to use to make sure it's well mixed. Well, I think I think life is a mix. Not just paint cans, but life. There are some there are some wonderful things in life, and there are some really hard things. There are times when we are successful and times when we feel like utter failures. There are times when we struggle and times when things come easy. Uh, there are things we're going to be good at in life and things we're never going to be good at. There are people who are going to love us through thick and thin and people who aren't going to like us. Uh, and, and that's because life is a mix. It's not all good. It's not all bad. And, and that means that when things are going wrong or when you're feeling bad or when you have a dark day, it doesn't mean anything's wrong. It just means that's part of the mix. And life comes to us um, as a whole package. We celebrate the good times. We accept the bad times. And we trust God to see us through. And all things considered, it's a fine mix. And most of us would not miss it for the world. Okay. Our scripture reading this morning is, is going to be from the sixth chapter of Luke, verses 20 through 42. Um, and I, um, I, I'm going to give you a little background. We're, we're going to blend the sermon and the scripture reading, actually, this morning. So let me let me say before we begin, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Um, so a little background. Jesus, as you recall from uh, the last couple of weeks, Jesus spent a night in prayer on the mountain. Um, and after a night of prayer, he chose 12 disciples, 12 apostles to be his inner circle and to become the model for our own discipleship, our own, our own following. And as the little group came down the mountain, they found uh, a great crowd waiting for them, as people tended to do when Jesus was around. So Jesus puts whatever plans he may have had on hold, and after a time of healing, he begins to preach and, and, and teach. Um, and this particular sermon uh, has come to be called by later generations the Sermon on the Plain. It has some things in common with Matthew's longer Sermon on the Mount, but it also has some distinctive elements of its own. Jesus begins this sermon with a series of blessings and woes. Then he looked up at his disciples and he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. 
Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. Ah, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. Blessings and woes. Now, if, if you look in, in almost any Bible, you'll see that those, those lines are laid out in a kind of a poetic style. And that's, that's an initial clue that, that there may be reasons not to bring us a, a slavish, literal reading um, to these, these blessings and woes. Because I think if we do that, um, I, I think we. I think it raises some problems. Raises some problems for me, at least. To offer just one example, um, I don't know. Is a life of poverty and chronic hunger is that is that really a, a blessing? Is, is it a blessing uh, not to be able to afford medical care, um, not to be able to buy school supplies for your kids? Uh, in fact, I would go so far as to say that the that the social structures that, that foster poverty and, and hunger and inequality, that, that those structures are in direct opposition to God's will for his, for his children. Um, now, I could, raise, I could raise other questions about these, these uh, blessings and, and woes, but, but you probably see my point. Uh, and my point is not that we don't take these seriously, um, but rather we take them seriously enough to try to read them and hear them the way uh, Jesus meant them to be heard. It's worth remembering that Jesus lived in a time and a culture when, when rabbis, teachers like Jesus, <clears throat> often used sweeping, exaggerated statements in order to catch the ear, to catch the attention, and, and to make a point. Or, or to quote my, my beloved Old Testament professor, uh, A.B. Rhodes, Jesus, as a Hebrew, spoke in whole mouthfuls. Um, and, and, and this style of teaching was common, and Jesus himself loved this style of teaching. This is why Jesus can talk about, about camels trying to squeeze through the eye of needles. That's not a literal statement. That's clearly a, an exaggeration, a metaphor. On other occasions, Jesus pokes fun at the Pharisees for straining the gnats out of their wine cups and yet swallowing camels whole. This is, the same, this is the same style of teaching that led Jesus to say that if, you're, if, you're, if your hands or your eyes get in the way of loving and serving God, then gouge them out, cut them off. Again, exaggeration. But, but I'm, I'm not saying we don't take this seriously. Um, what I am saying is that rather than, rather than begin by 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 dissecting each and every word and phrase that 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 maybe we start on the sermon on the plane by trying to catch the broad teaching of Jesus that lies behind the metaphor and the poetry and the exaggeration there's certainly a place for first first by verse study but today let's let's begin by getting the lay of the land in this in this forest um, before we start focusing on on individual trees so so, so what is the broad teaching behind these teachings, behind these, these blessings and woes? Well, in a nutshell, uh, the point here is that the values and certainties uh, of the world around us are almost always at odds with God's vision for humanity. In a few well-chosen words, in a few vivid images, Jesus basically undermines all the stuff that most of us have been taught to chase after in life. Wealth, popularity, happiness. Now, it's not that there's anything wrong with having money. It's not that there's anything wrong with, with, with having friends. Uh, and, there's, and there's nothing wrong with being happy. 
But here's the problem. If, if those are my life goals, if those are the engines that drive all my choices and my directions and my passions and my energy, well, to put it bluntly, in that case, I am wasting my life, at least in Jesus' eyes, I am wasting my life. This is what Jesus was getting at, I think, when he said, Whoa, woe to you who are full now. Woe to you who are full of the wrong stuff, the stuff that does not satisfy, the stuff that does not finally fill us, the stuff that does not save us. Woe to you who are full now, because one of these days you're going to wake up and discover just how desperately hungry you are, just how much you have been starving your spirit through all these years. Yeah, that's what happens when life is based on a daily diet of entertainment and successful investments and racking up lots of likes on Facebook. Okay, well, if, if we can agree that, that that is a broad message here, um, then it raises a question. If, 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 if I'm not supposed to chase after all the stuff that, that my culture holds out and dangles in front of me like a carrot on a stick, then, then how, are we, how are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to live? What does matter? Let's be to the words of Jesus. More Jesus, less Mike. That's always a good policy. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your, your, your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Okay. Can I, can I sum that up? I mean, is it fair to say that what Jesus is talking about here is love and forgiveness and kindness? But in broad strokes, that's, that's what he's offering to us. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? to you. For, for even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good. And lend expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Again, in broad strokes, what are we talking about here? Helpfulness, making the world better, reaching beyond our own little comfortable circles and bringing in folks who might look different or think differently. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Okay, just a second. I always get a little spasm of heartburn on that one. I'll let that go down. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down shaken together, running over. All this will be poured into your lap, for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. He also told them a parable. Can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully qualified will be like the why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, friend, let me, let me take out the speck in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye? Oh, you hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Again, behind the metaphors and the story, what do we got here? Humility, forbearance, 
fixing ourselves before we try to fix others, and as disciples, trying to be more like our teacher. Now, the truth is, these teachings are so easy to understand, but admittedly, they are more difficult to put into practice. In fact, in some ways, that's been our escape clause. We look at these and we say, well, nobody could really live that way. Nobody could really exist in the world in that way. And, and, so, we, and so we put those things on the back burner. That's, that's the way we tend to approach them. But I don't think that's a healthy way. <clears throat> let me offer let me offer a way to think about this, but I'm going to need you to, uh, to, to, to go with me on this. A little, little imagination here. Um, it, it, say, say that say I've never seen a bicycle in my life. Nobody. Nobody's ever seen a bicycle. Um, I, I've, never, I've never imagined such a thing as a bicycle. Um, and then one day, Jesus shows up, and he, and he gives me a bicycle. And he says, Mike, this is for you. If, if, you, if you will ride this bicycle, it'll make you smile. If you ride this bicycle enough, it'll make you healthy. And every time you ride this bicycle, you are, you are blessing God's green world and, and making things a little better than they would be otherwise. And then Jesus gets on the bicycle and he demonstrates. He, he rides it up and down the street. He gets back. He, he parks it in my driveway. And he says, there, that's for you. I give it to you. And then he goes on about his way, probably delivering bicycles to other people. And so I, I look this bicycle over, and, and I got to say, the whole thing just looks impossible. I mean, I, I, I get on it, and I, I can't even balance it when I'm sitting still. How am I supposed to balance it while I'm pedaling and steering and, 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 and rolling down the road? Well, yeah, sure, Jesus did it, but you know, he's Jesus. He's got that got that Jesus uh, magic going for him, uh, and and I'm I'm not Jesus. At the same time, I don't want to just ignore this gift from my Lord, and so I, I so I begin to study it. I begin to study it. I I I, I go to school. I, I enroll in online courses, and I get a degree in bicycle mechanics. Uh, I, I, I learned how I learned how the gears work and how to readjust them. Uh, I inflate the tires. Uh, I, I get on and I adjust the seat and the handlebar so they fit so they fit my my frame. I memorize stopping distances. If I lock the brakes up, I memorize how long it'll take me to stop on dry pavement versus wet pavement. I study up on the rules of the road. I, I finally know so much about bicycles that I begin to write articles. And I discover there are, there are other people out there who are fascinated by bicycleology. A, a group of them actually get together and they pay me to, to, to make a, offer a weekly lecture on bicycles. I mean, I, I've got it. I have learned everything there is about this bicycle that Jesus gave me. Enough that I can tell other people about it, too. And maybe one of these days, I will actually learn how to ride the thing. All right. Forgive, forgive a, a silly parable with a serious point. And the point is this. It is, it is possible to be so dedicated to learning about the teachings of Jesus, to, to revering the teachings of Jesus, memorizing the teachings of Jesus, that we never get around to practicing those teachings. And I don't think Jesus left us the Sermon on the Plain so that we could spend 2,000 years dissecting it. He gave us the Sermon on the Plain along with a whole bunch of other teachings so that we can try it out, so that we can put it into practice. Jesus wraps up the Sermon on the Plain with a parable, and I and I want to actually I want to come back to that parable next week and look at it in a little more detail. But the gist of the parable is this: putting Jesus' words into practice in our own lives is like building a house on a nice, flat, solid, unshakable rock. 
and 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 not putting those words of Jesus into practice, just repeating them, or just learning about them, or just uh, studying the, the the Greek behind them, not putting those teachings into practice is like building a house or a life on shifting sand. How do you think that turns out? So here's the thing. <clears throat> we will never we will never know how to ride a bike until we get on and pedal and fall down and get back up and pedal some more and fall down and get back up. And we will never understand the sermon on the plane. Never understand the sermon on the plane here. We'll never know how this stuff works in real life unless we try it out, fall down, and then try some more. Maybe it's not as hard as it looks, or maybe it is. But either way, let's find out. Okay, I'm sitting at getting a trouble note here. I don't know if I'm still going out or not, uh, but I'll keep going. My uh, my assistant at the other end of the dining room table says this is still going out. Okay. Let's um, let's do our affirmation of faith. Again, we haven't done that every week either. Affirmation of faith, you recall, is just a moment in the worship service when we remind ourselves uh, what we believe, our, our sort of core foundation values as, as Christians. And I, I want to do that today with um, uh, a bit of personal reminiscence, if you'll allow me. Um, my grandmother, Agatha Louise Slack, to give her her, her, her birth name, uh, died a couple of weeks ago. She died at the very ripe and very old age of 104. She was born April 13th, 1916, and she died a couple of weeks after her most recent birthday. Uh, she was in a nursing home in LaGrange, Kentucky. My mother called me to tell me that she my grandmother was going downhill, that she was uh, had her eyes closed, was no longer eating or drinking, wasn't responding. So early the next morning, I drove to LaGrange and, and went to the nursing home and masked up and did all the stuff you have to do to get in right now and, and spent an hour, maybe a little more than an hour, just sitting beside her bed, um, telling stories and, and, and reminiscing and, and saying thank you. Um, and reminding her of the the good some of the good stories we had shared together. Um, and and as I got ready to leave, as I got ready to leave, I said, you know, you don't have to be afraid of anything. God, God has loved you for over a hundred years, well over really, because God knew you and loved you before you ever came into the world. Um, and after loving you so long, God is not going to change his mind. Um, he's not going to forget your name or lose track or look away when you need him. You have lived through you have lived through more wars than I'd want to count. You have lived through the Great Depression and the Spanish flu pandemic and now you're about to make it through the COVID-19 pandemic and and God has held you in his hand the whole time, even when you didn't know it, especially when you didn't know it. So relax. Rest easy. When we can't hang on to God anymore, God keeps hanging on to us. And when everything is done, it will all come out all right. Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I tell you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. Friends, Jesus would not lie to us and I would not lie to my grandmother. This is what I believe. This is my faith. If this is what you believe, then say amen. Say it out loud. Say amen. amen. 
If this is your faith, say amen. If this is your hope, say amen. amen. And if it is on the promises of Jesus that you take your stand as long as you live and when you die, say amen. Amen. Me too. Me too. To God alone be the glory. I want to take a few moments for prayers and intercessions today. I am um, thinking of my grandmother uh, and my mother's loss uh, this week. I'm also thinking of mothers in general and how grateful I am for my mother and for the mother of my children, how richly blessed I have been by uh, nurturing women in my, in my life. Um, we continue as always to pray for our leaders, uh, for the medical community, for folks who are at risk serving us during this time of the COVID virus. Uh, I want us to pray for, for strength and determination to stay the course. We are all feeling antsy and eager to get back to normal and to eat out again and get rid of those uncomfortable masks. But it is, uh, it is better to do this right. It is better to continue to show love for each other um, in, in the most concrete ways rather than becoming part of the problem. So I offer that for our prayers today. And uh, I want to pray for the, the good work of the folks at uh, Our Daily Bread who are on the front lines feeding people who probably otherwise couldn't feed themselves. And to pray in general for the poor and the elderly and the sick and the homeless, the folks who are really hit the hardest when hard things come. I'll leave a little moment of silence here and invite you to say out loud the name of anyone that you want to bring before God in prayer today. Go ahead and feel free to do that out loud or in your heart. And let's gather these prayers into the hands of Jesus. Uh, as we gather ourselves in his hands by praying together the prayer that he taught us. You ready? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, we have one more song today. Again, a song I think that will be uh, familiar to you. Change my heart, O God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God. May I be like you. We'll sing that through a couple of times. And then you are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. All right. Please, uh, please join in with me. I don't want to do a solo. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you again. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. 
Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Be strong, be safe, be faithful. Amen. Mm -hmm.